I want to ask you about your domestic agenda. You've gotten a lot of questions about voting rights, Mr. President, but I want to ask you about black voters, one of your most loyal constituencies. Yep. I was in Congressman Clyburn's district mm -hmm. yesterday in South Carolina. You opened this news conference talking about him. I spoke to a number of black voters who fought to get you elected and now they feel as though you are not fighting hard enough for them and their priorities. And they told me they see this push on voting rights more as a last minute PR push than it is a legitimate effort to get legislation passed. So what do you say to these black voters who say that you do not have their backs as you promised on the campaign trail? I've had their back. I've had their back my entire career. I've never not had their back. And I started on the voting rights issues long, long ago. That's what got me involved in politics in the first place. And uh, I think part of the problem is, uh, um, look, there's, there's significant disagreement in every community on whether or not the timing of assertions made by people has been in the most timely way. So I'm sure that there are those who are saying that why didn't Biden push John Lewis' bill as hard as he pushed it the last month? Why didn't he push it six months ago as hard as he did now? Um, uh, the fact is that there is um, there's a timing that is not of one's own choice is somewhat dictated by events that are happening in country and around the world as to what the focus is. But part of the problem is, as well, I have not been out in the community nearly enough. I've been here an awful lot. I find myself in a situation where uh, um, I don't get a chance to look people in the eye because of both COVID and things that are happening in Washington to be able to go out and do the things that I've always been able to do pretty well. Connect with people. Let them take a measure of my sincerity. Let them take a measure of who I am. For example, I mean, as I pointed out in South Carolina, um, you know, last time when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I got the Voting Rights Act extended for 25 years and I got Strom Thurmond to vote for it. That's what I've been doing my whole career. And so the idea that I, that, that I didn't either anticipate or because I didn't speak to it as fervently as they want me to earlier. In the meantime, I was spending a lot of time, spent hours and hours and hours talking with my colleagues on the Democratic side, trying to get them to agree that if in fact this occurred, if this push continued, that they would be there for John Lewis and anyway. So, um, but I think that's, that's a problem that is my own making by not communicating as much as I should have. Yet, you find that uh, when you deal with members of the Black Caucus and others in the, in the United States Congress, I still have very close working relationships. So it's like every community. I'm sure that there are those in the community and I'm a, I'm a big labor guy. I'm sure there's people in labor saying, why haven't I been able to do A, B, C, or D? So it's just going to take a little bit of time. You're, you put Vice President Harris in charge of voting rights. Are you satisfied with her work on this issue? And can you guarantee, do you commit that she will be your running mate in 2024, provided that you run again? Yes and yes. Expand. Pardon me? Do you care to expand? On no, there's no need to. I mean, you know, I asked okay. the question. He, she's going to be my running mate, number one. And number two, I did put her in charge. I think she's doing a good job. Let me ask you, big picture, particularly when you think about voting rights and the struggles you've had to unify your own party around voting rights. Unity was one of your key campaign promises. Yep. In fact, in your inaugural address, you said your whole soul was in bringing America together, uniting our people. People heard the speech that you gave on voting rights in Georgia recently, in which you described those who are opposed to you to George Wallace and Jefferson Davis, and some people took exception to that. 
What do you say to those who are offended by your speech? And is this country more unified than it was when you first took office? Number one, anybody who listened to the speech, I did not say that there were going to be a George Wallace or a Bull Connor. I said we're going to have a decision in history that is going to be marked just like it was then. You either voted on the side that didn't make you George Wallace or didn't make you Bull Connor. But if you did not vote for the Voting Rights Act back then, you were voting with those who agreed with Connor, those who agreed with, with, and, and so, and I, I think Mitch did a real good job of making it sound like I was attacking them. If you notice, I haven't attacked anybody publicly, any senator, any, 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 any congressman publicly. And my disagreements with them have been made to them, communicated to them privately or in person with them. Uh, my desire still is, look, I underestimated one very important thing. I never thought that the Republicans, like for example, I said they got very upset, I said, there are 16 members of the present United States Senate who voted to extend the Voting Rights Act. Now, they got very offended by that. That wasn't an accusation, just stating a fact. What has changed? What happened? What happened? Why is there not a single Republican? Not one. That's not the Republican. So that's not an attack. Is the country more unif is the country more unified than when you first took office? Uh, the answer is, based on some of the stuff we've got done, I'd say yes, but it's not nearly unified as it should be. Look, I still contend, and I know you'll have a right to judge me by this. I still contend that unless you can reach consensus in a democracy. You cannot sustain the democracy. And so this is a real test. Whether or not my, uh, my, my, uh, my counterpart in China is right or not, when he says autocracies are the only thing that are going to prevail because democracies take too long to make decisions and countries are too divided. I believe we're going through one of those inflection points in history that occurs every several generations or even more than that, even more time than that, where things are changing almost regardless of any particular policy. The world's changing in big ways. We're going to see, if you've heard me say this before, we're going to see more change in the next 10 years than we've seen in the last 50 years because of technology, because of fundamental alterations in alliances, that are occurring, not because of any one individual, just because of the nature of things. And so I think you're going to see an awful lot of transition. And the question is, can we keep up with it? Can we maintain the democratic institutions that we have, not just here, but around the world, to be able to generate democratic consensus on how to proceed? It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. But it requires, it requires leadership to do it. And I'm not giving up on the prospect of being able to do that. Thank you.